Welcome back to the newest episode of the Everything Transformers, Everything G.I. Joe podcast, where, of course, we talk about Everything Transformers and Everything G.I. Joe. Now, let's get right into it. We're going to jump right into it. Scheduling-wise, last episode, we talked about how we would do once a month, and that would be kind of hit the middle of the month. And you know what? Two things derailed that from happening this month. The first thing, the major thing, was San Diego Comic-Con was scheduled to happen after this episode of the podcast was scheduled to come out. And I thought, well, that's kind of silly. I mean, San Diego Comic-Con's a huge thing and people are going to want to talk about it. So why don't I delay this podcast episode so I include the San Diego Comic-Con stuff in this podcast, which was a great idea. And that's what we did. But the second thing that still delayed us was that my main computer where I do my editing decided to die. Actually, it died in the middle of of rendering a new YouTube video, that G.I. Joe San Diego Comic-Con panel uh, video. It died, it killed, it killed my editing computer and I had to get a replacement parts and it was all stress. Anyways, we're back on track now. So let's get right back into it and let's talk about some acquisitions that I've got since the last time we talked. Now, the thing is, the last time we talked, what's happened since is TFCon 2024 in Toronto. Basically, leading up to TFCon, I always kind of switch gears and I have a heavy focus on Transformers. So I, the G.I. Joe kind of takes a back burner for a few minutes and I try to collect as many Transformers so I can bring them there and we trade them and we sell them and it's a great time. So for acquisitions, I mean, obviously because TFCon is done, it's heavy on the Transformers. So what I did this year, I actually did a live stream where I went over all the goodies that I acquired during TFCon. And basically, that's over on the channel if you want to check that out. So we're going to just slot in. I got a whole whack of Transformers and some other cool little things. So go check that out. But I did have two things to note. So I actually went to the thrift store today. And, you know, sometimes you just get a feeling in your gut. And I just walked into the thrift store, looked at the bottom row of racks, and what was there? There was a bag of Starcom toys, which I don't actually collect. But as soon as I seen it, I knew it had to come home with me. So I picked it up and it's pretty cool. I'll probably post pictures to Instagram or Twitter. Anyways, that was really cool. That happened today. And then last week, I picked up a Facebook lot of Transformers from Marketplace. It cost me $25. It was mainly kids toys, like modern, like R.I.D., uh, Robots in Disguise, like Starscream, uh, Grimlock. Prime, Drift, a few of those characters, Wingblade, uh, really cool. But in the middle of that lot, it was a box. And I knew, I kind of noticed something in the picture, and I, I went to go purposely get it because of this. In the middle of all these kids' toys, modern kids' toys, there was a Generation 1 Jet Fire. And he was so minty white, he's so complete, uh, I don't know, it doesn't really make sense. I'm like, why did they have just the one Generation 1 figure? In with all these uh, these uh, modern figures. Anyways, score for me. Because the funny thing is, I actually have a complete Generation 1 Jetfire. But one of his shoulder braces where the plastic and the metal meets is broken. And this guy doesn't have a broken shoulder. So I'm going to basically either repair mine. I, have to, I haven't decided yet. i got to look at both of them side to side. I want to either repair mine or swap this one for mine. I'll see how it goes. I'll probably make some updates on Twitter at some point. But basically, that was a hell of a hot deal. A minty white Generation 1 Jetfire for $25 Canadian? That is crazy. And plus a whole other box of stuff to cover that, the price of that. So, that's cool. That's enough for acquisitions. Go watch that live stream video and you'll figure out what I got at TFCon as well. So, let's get jump right into it. So, we're basically here. The first half of this podcast is going to, we're going to talk about TFCon. 2024 and basically also i'll let you know something i had done a little different it was when i was there this year i started kind of vlogging where i'm like walking around talking to the camera i'm after i edit this podcast down and get this published that's the next thing i'm going to be working on uh basically just a simple vlog video you know it's probably going to be like about 10 minutes long it probably won't make any sense I'm just testing it out. I've never really done one of those before. Anyways, we'll see how that goes. I, th I think it'll be interesting little insights into things there. Anyways, but 
that was basically, I mean, it's kind of late now, that video. TFCon was a couple of weekends ago, a few weekends ago. And once again, I was delayed because my main editing computer decided to die on me. Anyways, so let's jump right on to it. Now, the thing about TFCon for me is, I mean, first of all, it is, it was always the biggest fan run Transformers event. And I mean, since then, TFCon, it started in Toronto. It basically has expanded and it has uh, several events throughout the years in the United States now as well. So it, it is it is, it is, is a big thing. The Toronto one, I go there. It's a four-hour drive from my house. So usually what happens is it's a three-day event where it's like Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I'll often skip the Friday night stuff uh, because, once again, it's a four-hour drive. i got to get there. Um, so what happens is I'll get everything packed up and I'll leave at like 6 o'clock in the morning make the four hour drive in the hope that I get there for like 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. And then I can just jump into the the uh, the convention and do do my thing. The thing is, you know, when you have to leave six o'clock in the morning, sometimes it's hard to get up six o'clock in the morning. Anyways, I didn't leave on time. I didn't leave until about 6.50. And of course, you know, you're going on a major highway, there's traffic. But I ran into this construction. Summertime is construction season here in Canada. And basically, I ended up getting to the convention later than I anticipated. I actually didn't get there until about 11.30, 11.40. And I actually missed the first panel. Uh, it was about Generation 1 um, actors, I think. Anyways, so I missed the first panel. And kind of disappointed, but you know what? Whatever, got a rebound, jumped in, made sure I got my ticket, made sure I registered uh, for my hotel room, and let's get right to it. So, like, for me, and I've discussed this uh, previously in other videos, the thing about TFCon for me and the thing, the path to success to make sure you come home with some amazing deals is I always arrange pre-con deals. So I go on the forums, I go on Facebook, I post, hey, this is what I have to trade. What do you guys have? Because I'm looking for X, Y, Z. And basically it works out great. I've actually created a whole video about this as well, which I don't think anyone watched. But it's just my strategy for like specifically a specific uh, con like TFCon. It's a great little thing. It works out great. So I think going in, uh, uh, probably I was a little nervous because up until about a week and a half before this convention, I only had about one or two minor deals, but upon arriving at the convention on that Saturday morning, I had, I think, 13 or 14 pre-con deals arranged and basically had to track people down, texting people, get the stuff, trade the stuff. Um, anyways, it was great because like you see in that live stream video I had mentioned earlier, I came home with some truly awesome stuff. Anyways, so let's get right to it. So, so the first, I mean, okay, this is the thing. When you get to TFCon, like you got to go check out the dealer room right away. And I have to be, uh, I have to be honest. I went there and I almost got overwhelmed for a few minutes and I had to like recenter myself because there was so many people there walking around and there was so much like goods and content and like just everything to look at. It was like, sensory overload and I was like whoa I was not prepared for this I was like I mean I've gone like 14 years in a row but I was just it was seen for some reason bigger this year I don't know there was just more things to, to look at anyways I had to take myself out I had to like just make a little walk around first to kind of regroup myself and be like okay let's go look at some transformers because I was not prepared for the amount of stuff that they actually had there so First up, so after I did a normal little uh, scope out the dealer room, um, I went to the first convention, uh, sorry, the first panel, which was included uh, Bob Badusky and Simon Furman. And they were talking about the Marvel comics and the USA versus the Mar uh, the UK run. And it was some really interesting insight. I have to be honest, Bob looked like sort of like grumpy on the panel. I'm not really sure if something happened. I got there a few minutes late. Um, anyways, but Simon, he was great. He was talking about all the stuff about the UK, how they had to do stuff really independent of the USA, uh, Marvel brand of Transformers. And there was a lot of really cool insight into that. I think I've got some video of that that I'll probably end up in the vlog that I mentioned earlier. 
Anyways, so that one was really cool. Simon is, like, he's such a nice guy. Like, I mean, I, he was there the whole time. You could just walk up and talk to him. Uh, they had, like, a little desk out front with all the guest actors. And uh, it was, he's, 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 a real, he's a real nice person to talk to. Um, like, for me, uh, a lot of times, unless the panel really, like, catches uh, my interest, I don't usually watch the full 50 minutes of the panel because that's time you're missing out on going around the dealer room. And the whole point of going to a Transformer convention is to come home with more Transformers that you needed for your collection. The next panel was a Beast Wars one, which I skipped. I'm not really into Beast Wars. But the third panel of the day was for voice actors and the narrator of Transformers, Victor Caroli, which i probably butchering his last name because I can't remember how they pronounced it at the time. Um, that was He was really interesting to uh, listen to. Because basically, he had never wanted to do conventions before. And I think this was only like his uh, first time at TFCon Toronto. But I think he said he'd only previously done one of the other TFCons. Because basically, he said that he knows nothing about Transformers. And he always felt that he would serve no purpose to go to these conventions. Because the fans would ask him questions and he would know nothing about it. He was basically just the narrator at the beginning of some of these episodes and told to say these things and his cool voice. And basically that's all he would do. So he had real no insight into like, you know, the war, the Autobots versus the Decepticons, how Prime and Megatron would battle. He was just like, I'm the narrator and that's what my job was and that's all I did. So that's why he never really got into doing the convention scene. But now he's kind of more opened up to it and he finds it fun and it's cool. He likes talking with the fans. So that was really cool. A little That was a good panel to see. I like when they bring this new stuff to the convention and you get to like just experience something different. So that one was a really good one. Um, the next panel, and of course, like the panels are kind of like every 50 minutes. But like, like I said, I don't really stay the whole time sometimes because I, I like the, the dealer room is really large and you've got to like go to all the tables, see what you notice that you want, check prices, uh, check, you know, the, the, the real gems are often in the bins underneath people's tables. And like, there was two instances where basically I was just digging through tubs of like transformers and transformer parts. One guy had this huge tub of transformer parts, and I basically had it all out on the floor, and I was looking through um, basically uh, uh, insecticon pieces and junker parts, and I'm like, oh, I can take this junker part because I've got a part at home or with me that I can slam together and restore a figure. So I did an inferno, and I did a shrapnel, and I did a kick back. Uh, basically restored them while I was there uh, from parts that I only cost me a couple of dollars. Another guy, he had this bin and it was like, I think it was like late on Sunday or yeah, Sunday. And it's like, he had not, he had no clue what was in the bin. I don't know if he had purchased somebody's collection, but like he only opened the bin up like late into the, the convention and people were digging through it. And like he wouldn't sell some of it because he, I guess he hadn't gone through it personally. Um, it was really weird. Anyways, I did manage to pick up a few pieces from him, some junkers and some stuff that I needed or whatever. Anyways, that was interesting. So let's see. Let's see what we're talking here. So back to Saturday, though. Back to Saturday. One of the other panels, they actually had Stan Bush, who, you know, is known for that amazing music from the Transformers, the 86 movie. And I actually actually skipped that panel. I just felt that my time, because your time there is limited. And I just didn't feel that his panel was going to interest me enough to basically skip out on trades or basically that real concentrated time in the dealer room. Like there are so many tables that have so much stuff on them. And then people have like shelving behind their tables that you have to look at as well. So, I mean, sometimes you got to make decisions and you got to decide like, you know, am I going to go to a panel or am I going to go really search the dealer room? Anyways, dealer room closes at like six, I believe. And then I had to go get some food because I had to get powered up for the room trading that was ahead that night. Now, for those of you who don't know, room trading is where the action is at. And basically, I mean, you got to be 
you got to have a bit of like, uh, what's the word, cojones, or I mean, it's not for everyone, but basically, it's often, it works better, I find, if you have somebody to go with. Right this weekend, I was by myself, uh, nobody was there with me, I had met some friends there or whatever, but they had their own rooms they had to manage. So I couldn't really go around with them. But long story short, you basically, people, there's a bulletin board system. People post little things like, hey, I've got these things for sale and trade, blah, 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 blah. Come to room like 809.21 between the hours of 8 and 11 and you can look at my transformers. So people have stuff set up on their beds, on the tables. They have like bins, they have boxes. They have tons of stuff and you go in there and you walk in people's rooms and like, you're like, Hey, I'm just gonna look at your stuff for a second. Oh, nothing here. Goodbye. I'll go. Or like, Oh my God, you got the best stuff ever. And you either buy, sell, trade. And so what I do is I think outside the box and a lot of people have included in about this. I bring my stuff in a big bin with me when, as I go to these rooms. And so what I'll do is I'll often end up selling stuff to people in these rooms or trading it for other stuff they have there themselves that they have available. Works out great for me. I'm really surprised more people have included in on that. Worked out great. Room trading, it's not for the faint of heart because it's kind of like, you know, like you, it's awkward at times. You run into some people like there was this one room I went into and there was this guy and he was like sitting at the table. But like his wife was basically in bed watching TV and you're like, ha ha, ha hey, <laughs> so it's kind of weird. But like other people, the parties are rocking. Um, there's this one story just quickly where I, uh, I went to a room and I started to talk to these three guys and the, the, the one of the daughters there and we were chatting and I had brought my stuff. And this guy who was another guest who came in the room after me started to look through my things. And he noticed that I had in my random 80s bin, not my Transformer bin, that I had um, uh, some Mighty Max uh, like capsules, you know, that you open up and they've got the little figures in them. He had never heard of them. He was a young guy. Like he was only like 20 or so like that. He had never heard of Mighty Max before, but understood what it was like Polly Pocket, I guess. And he's like, you know what? I kind of want to buy these. I'm like, yeah, cool, dude. They're, you know, X amount of money. He's like, okay, cool. But I left my wallet in my room. I'm like, okay, well, you're going to go grab it? He's like, yeah, I'll go grab it. I'll be back in a couple of minutes. I'm like, hey, guys, do you mind, to the room owners, do you mind if I hang out here while I wait for this guy to come back? And they're like, yeah, 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 sure, 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 sure. Um, Anyways, uh, so so I'm sitting there, and I'm talking to these uh, two guys, and they're, they're, they're big YouTubers. Oh, I can't remember their channel name now. It was like the Mint Collected or Mint something. It was a big comic guy, and I can't remember. I apologize. I got to go look it up now in a second. Anyways. So I'm talking to these two guys and I'm like, man, it's been like 10 minutes and that guy hasn't come back. And I turn around and the guy that said he was going to go leave and get his wallet has been talking to the third guy behind me the whole time. I'm like, oh, you're back. He's like, no, I haven't left yet. I'm like, oh my gosh. Wow. I was so distracted with the conversation with the first two guys that I didn't ever notice it. Anyway, so eventually he left. I had to stay there for another 10 minutes chatting these these people up and that's okay and all these people are super friendly they're american and eventually he came back he purchased the poly po uh, sorry the mighty max uh, things that i had and it was just so funny because he had never heard of them before and i was just so surprised that he just found them so cool that he ended up purchasing them and then one of the uh, the daughter there ended up purchasing some stuff for me as well uh so it was really funny but these room sales and trades really work out great and if you ever go, I, I'm assuming they have it at the other TF cons. I'm assuming this happens at other conventions that you should really check it out. Put your best foot forward. You can find some amazing deals after the dealer room closes. Anyways, that worked out great for me. That was a whole night of going to different rooms, uh, hanging out, trading, buying. Anyways, it worked out great. So Sunday comes. Um, yeah, you know, it's kind of a weird time. You're going to the panel, you're going to the dealer room, but at some point you have to check out from your hotel room as well. Uh, so I made sure I was, uh, all cleaned up. I was ready to check out the hotel room before I went to the convention. Basically, uh, I went to the dealer room and you know what, like checked it out again. You, you know what, like stuff changes. Now, years ago, uh, like I said, I've been going to TFCon for about 13, 14 years, more on the first half like say like the first five seven eight years what they used to do 
was they would do, it would be TFCon. Sa- Friday, Saturday would be 100% Transformers. And then Sunday was 80 stuff. Now, 80 stuff includes Transformers. But to get a table on the Saturday, you had to have a certain percentage of Transformer stuff. Uh, the stuff on the 80s, uh, on the Sunday, some vendors would leave like, you know, I don't have enough Transformers to basically sell for two days. They would leave. Some other vendors would show up only for the Sunday and they would come in with some Transformers. They'd come in with 80s toys, G.I. Joe, you know, all this stuff or whatever. And that was really cool because I actually, as a fan, I enjoyed that a bit more than the the standard that is now where Friday, Saturday, and Sunday is all Transformers. Saturday, Sunday is basically all of the same vendors. Um, if you go there and spend a lot of time in the dealer room, you do see a lot of the stuff on Saturday, and then Sunday is kind of like, well, maybe I don't have to stay here as long, or you know what I mean? Like, There's not as much excitement for Sunday because all the vendors are the same. I enjoyed it the previous way where the Sunday was the 80s. But you know what? I understand that they're trying to grow the TFCon. It's a huge, quote unquote, transformer convention. So basically, I mean, I understand why they do it. So I get it. It works out great. I mean, it's the same for me. I stayed the whole day. I basically, I think the the convention ends at 4 or 4.30. And I think I left at 3.30. So it was basically I stayed the whole time. There was lots to look at. I'm always digging through things. Uh, I talked about digging through bins. I totally missed this one guy's bin where like he just had like everything in the bin was $5. I'm still kicking myself because he said that bin was uh, level. It was like one of those like 63 liter bins or whatever. You know what I mean? Like the big ones. Basically, I'm, I'm kicking myself because like there was like five things left in the bin when I found it. And even now, one of them was a incomplete um, Snapdragon, Generation 1 Snapdragon. And I was like, should I buy this? It doesn't have the head, but I'm like, I should have bought it. It was $5. And I'm even kicking myself right now because if you're a fan of the channel, you've heard me say before, I play the long game on everything. So like I would probably pick up that Snapdragon body, put it in a bin, and then like a year or two years from now, find a head or some of the accessories for it. I'd be fine with that. And I'm kicking myself for not picking that up. Anyways, so you got to look under those tables for all the deals. There was so much stuff there. I picked up so much stuff. For panels on Sunday, the thing is, some of the, a lot of the main stuff happens on Saturday. And I've already kind of talked about that. For Sunday has some of what I would consider the weaker panels. It's a lot more like fan driven panels. Now, these fans, they're hardcore fans and they do amazing work on their panels. Like they're, wow, there's some really good, we'll talk about that in a second. But the big one on Sunday is, and if you can see this guy, I always recommend it. Aaron Archer, former Hasbro designer. He always shows up. Uh, he's there with Proto Man. Um, big fan, a big Transformer fan. Aaron Archer, always a great thing to see his panels because he's able to provide such insight in the way Hasbro works. Uh, basically, based on the time he was there, he doesn't obviously work there anymore, but he's been a toy designer for years. I believe, I think he's worked at Kenner before, worked on Batman stuff. He worked on a lot of Transformers, Armada, Energon, that whole series, a bunch of other things. So it's really cool um, to see what he has to say about things. They did a specific deep dive into the designing of uh, Vector Prime. Um, and that was really cool. There was a lot of insight in how that comes to be, how Hasbro, like say the American company, works together with the Japanese Takara company um, and how they work things out. So that was amazing insight. I've got a bunch of video about that. I'll probably, some of it probably will end up in the vlog uh, with some music montage or whatever. Anyway, so stay tuned for that. That was really, really cool. I got a couple of videos that I'll probably turn into shorts and post those on the channel from that specific panel because he was offering some really good insight into stuff. After that, there was a really cool uh, fan-made Generation 2 panel. Basically, it was really well done. It was going over the confusion of when Generation 2 started in, like, say, North America versus Europe. And it showed basically every single product that was in the Generation 2 line. 
And I have to be honest, as a Transformer fan, I did not realize it was so confusing. And until you actually witnessed this panel, it was damn confusing, man. Holy snap. After that panel, of course, the day is starting to wind down. And basically, you need to do those final laps in the dealer room. People are starting to slash a few prices. You try to, you know, find those final deals. Um, one panel, I'm uh, sorry, one table I always visit is Russ. He is the guy, you'll see him in the vlog. He is the guy that has like the huge table. It's just full of these white bins. And I think personally, I think I've talked about Russ before. I think he has a time machine because I don't know how somebody can collect so many generation one parts. And be so organized. They have so many complete Generation 1 figures for sale. He is crazy. Anyways, great guy to deal with. You have to do realize, like, this is his business. So this is, he is there to make money. And you know what? He, he'll often give you deals on stuff. But, like, he's not going to be crazy. If something's, like, you know, $50, he's not going to, like, okay, I'll give it to you for $10. Like, he might knock off $5. But if you ask nicely... I think a lot of times you can get a deal from him as well. A lot of people might not know this. He is open to trading as well. So what I often do, because I know that he has the best selection of Generation 1 parts, and I don't buy 100% complete Generation 1 Transformers. Often I'll just buy the shells or incomplete figures, and I'll have to go find parts for them. Say like uh, on my shelf, I had a Generation 1 hard head that was missing his big shoulder cannon and I knew well I put it on my list and I had to find that at TFCon I found that in one of his many bins organized bins that he had uh and basically what I do sometimes is I collect stuff throughout the year there's some things I kind of know that he's into even to resell that's fine and what I do is I trade him basically he accepts my trade if he's interested and he values it and he gives me that amount of credit in his quote unquote store at the convention. And so basically I traded him a near complete generation two uh, Bruticus and, you know, and a few other things. And he gave me a bunch of credit. And I basically had my shopping list of what uh, generation one parts I wanted to come home with. And I basically was able to go through, pick a bunch of stuff out. Ooh, find some stuff. Oh, I need some sun streaker fists. Okay. Pick those up, pick up a couple of weapons. Oh, I have a minty astro train in my collection to trade wow i don't have a gun i'll pick up the gun for astro train now astro train's complete so that's what i did and that worked out great for me that might not work out great for everyone it just you know i'm a known customer to him now i see him every year i go i've been dealing with him for years uh he is the number one guy at the transformer convention for parts so if you need something go see russ uh he's a great guy to deal with Anyways, so that is basically TFCon 2024 in a nutshell. Watch out, watch for that blog that's coming. Uh, I'm going to get that out as soon as possible. And it's going to be kind of my first blog that I've edited together. So t bear with me for that. Anyways, so I think that's basically it for the convention part of the TFCon. We'll talk about what's coming up next. Okay, so let's move on to San Diego Comic-Con. Now, if you're a fan of the channel, I've already kind of done an in-depth look at the G.I. Joe panel. Uh, and that's a video up on the channel. Check that out. Anyway, so let's dive in. I have to say the panel, the stuff that happened for G.I. Joe at San Diego Comic-Con 2024 was pretty cool. They hit a high note. It was nicely done. The Twilight Guard, which is basically like a black crimson guard with these purple weapons and a cape. He has my interest peaked a little like originally i wasn't too into him but the more i see of him he, he looks pretty cool but however the only downside is that he is packed in a two pack which as a classified fan i have yet to buy any of the two packs just because they're really expensive right anyway so i mean maybe pick up that twilight somewhere down the road if you can find them um, by himself possibly Anyways, we'll see how that goes. I just want to make a note here. I don't know in my previous video. For some reason, I have kind of like a mental block in my head. And whenever I see Raptor 
I'll often call him Falcon because Falcon is a bird and Raptor is a bird and the character is bird-like. So if I ever switch up and am I referring to the Cobra character and I name him Falcon, you know who I'm talking about and that's Raptor. I do think they did a pretty good job with Raptor. Like we kind of get into the freaks of Cobra's side here now. And that's what Cobra is known for, those interesting characters. I think it's interesting now that they actually, if you pay attention, there's kind of three price points right now. And I noticed this after the fact. Basically, you got the mainline figures, which are like a set low price, uh, like $24 or $35 in Canada. So $24 US, $35 Canadian. And then you have the mid tier, which Raptor is one of those. He's not necessarily a, 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 a single mainline character, and he's not a deluxe character. He's in the middle. He's a bit more expensive, and I don't know the prices offhand in American right this second, but I think he's like $51 Canadian, so I'm not really sure if that's like uh, like $32 or $33 American. Anyways, and then you've got other characters like Road Pig, who comes with like a ton of accessories, and he's... In Can Canadian, he's $67. So there's three price points right now. And that's very interesting because why like kind of uh, Raptor falls in that middle one where he comes with that big, obviously his wings, but he doesn't go with too many accessories like Road Pig does. So it's interesting to see how this plays out. Anyways, just a point. Obviously, one of the big things of the show was we finally got the reveal of the Cobra Rattler. We all knew it was coming. I've done videos on that on the channel. I do think one of the big things about the Cobra Rattler reveal was that that silly first tier of patches. I don't know who approved that or how that got through, but I do think the HasLab community of people that normally back these projects was expecting that there was going to be four figures available in this offering just like the his tank just like the dragonfly so the idea that the number one uh tier was these three patches i don't, I don't know who who approved that and i think that was such a horrible idea i don't i don't know like those should have just been thrown in they could have came up with something else they could have came up with an extra piece of plastic for something the idea of these patches is really ridiculous and the idea that that was an unlock at eleven thousand. wow somebody dropped the ball on that one and i'm sure the fans will be giving them grief for a long time on that like I, I think I mentioned in the previous video, even during the live stream, people were going hashtag no patches because I think people were actually shocked that they didn't get a fourth figure so, and instead they got the patches. So, I mean, thing is, people got their orders in. People were going to support it no matter what came with it. People were going to support it no matter what came with it. So... It's just, I think a lot of people were expecting more value for their buck because obviously the price is a bit more expensive than the Dragonfly. Um, it's $50 more, but still, I, like, I'm not going to knock it for sure. The Cobra Rattler is an awesome vehicle, and they've done an amazing job on it. I have to say, though, the only, if I had to point out one thing, I don't know what is up with that Gunner Canopy. I think that's a bit of a weird design. It looks like it's from like, I don't know, Indiana Jones or some of that. I, I don't really sure where that's coming from. Uh, the stage show at Disney World has a, a, a plane and that reminds me of the canopy from it. Which is really weird because they obviously have the design for the real American hero Cobra Rattler. And they know what the Gunner Canopy looks like. I'm not really sure. Maybe they just were trying to get away from that one for one look of just we made this. A real American hero, Cobra Rattler, uh, large scale, uh, G.I. Joe classified. Maybe they're just trying to get away from that. And they want to give it a unique look to it, but not a necessarily fan of that canopy. While we're talking here, um, I was talking to a collector friend today and I was we were talking about the uh, classified Cobra Rattler offering and he's backing it. He's got in with a friend. They're going to save on some shipping. And I've made I'm vocal about this. Anyone who disagrees, feel free to leave in the comments. The idea, see, is that uh, the G.I. Joe classified, no, uh, classified line, no matter what you say, the only reason it exists is because of nostalgia. People were nostalgic for this brand. You know, I've talked about this before. You've got like these one for one release designs like Shipwreck that is basically a real American hero figure made classified size. The bat, uh, the original bat color, it's 
a real American hero figure may classify size. Nostalgia drives this line, and there, it's easy to see because, like, for the vehicles, what vehicles are we getting done? They're all real American hero designs. You're not seeing uh, spy troops or G.I. Joe versus Cobra vehicle designs uh, in when it came back out in the 2000s. You're getting the vehicles from the 80s. So that proves nostalgia drives this line. So sometimes, and I complained about this before. Look, I'm sorry. I'm allowed to complain. I'm a collector. I pay my money. Um, uh, sometimes when you see like the female drivers, these random characters come with these much desired uh, vehicles it frustrates me like for that unlock of the gi uh, sorry the cobra gunner uh for the rattler i mean completely original design and i'm assuming there's a lot of people out there that do like these original designs and they're an extra character to add to the display or whatever but me sometimes i would like i've said this before i would just prefer a regular cobra trooper like, put a blue Cobra Trooper in there, make him a little different, maybe give him the red Baklava or something like that. But, like, just put a Cobra Trooper in there and, like, doesn't need to be all gussied up and made into a unique character sometimes. That's just me. Because these original characters they create, like, say, some of the other, like, the gunner and the tactician for the Hiss tank, Hazlab, they don't really offer any nostalgia for me because they didn't exist their original characters. So, for me... I would care. I don't really care for those figures. Um, and that's just me. That's a personal thing. There's no attacking anyone saying that you're 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 not allowed to like these characters. That's just a me thing. So yeah, Cobra Rattler, pretty cool, really expensive. Anyways, we'll see how it goes. I'm at this point. I'm sure they will get to the eighteen thousand and the Baroness will on be unlocked. That is like the best character ever. One of the like really cool designs I've ever done. It'll be interesting to see how that works out. Now, moving on to some other G.I. Joe stuff at San Diego Comic-Con. Now, of course, um, we did get the reveal of a bunch of other characters. <laughs> I've seen this as soon as this happened. I've seen it on some uh, Facebook groups I'm on. People are like, oh man, the Fang, the Cobra Fang is in the background of one of the box art. So that means we're getting a Cobra Fang. And like people just don't think sometimes like there have been a ton of other vehicles shown on the background of the box art. I actually at some point, I can't remember exactly. I actually asked the uh, guy who does the photography on Twitter about like where these backgrounds come from. And he basically said, like, they come from, like, they're just designs they have, and they're just used as backgrounds. They have no indication of what's coming whatsoever. If you take, I think, uh, Classified Hawk, I think his uh, box art, he has the Triple T and the Cobra Stun. So, I mean, like, unless we're getting a Cobra Stun in the next year or so, like, these are just backgrounds. While I do agree, don't get me wrong, the Cobra Fang would be an awesome addition to the classified line, but just because it's on the box art in the background, it's all fuzzy, does not mean that this is some kind of hidden thing where it's like, oh my gosh, they're they're alluding to what's coming down the road. No, it, it's meant to tie it all together, link that nostalgia, what we talked about earlier. So you see the Cobra Fang and you're like, oh, that's super cool. You start to think about all this stuff about G.I. Joe and realize how much you enjoy it. Thus, you're gonna buy the figure. So that's where that stuff comes in. Sometimes, see, this is the difference. This is the difference. I don't actually consider myself a fanboy. I'm doing air quotes here. I am just a fan. I enjoy the stuff. I go, you know, I get collected or whatever. But some people out there are fanboys, right? And they're like, they go crazy. Oh my God, the next HasLab is going to be a killer whale. And it's going to support like 10 characters on it. And it's going to be so big. And it's going to be amazing. That stuff... It's probably never going to happen. And I don't mean to break anyone's hearts out there. But you got to be realistic. So when it comes to vehicles, right now Hasbro is kind of like slow dripping these out to us or whatever. So the idea that just because something's on a box as a background doesn't mean the Cobra Fang is coming. Once again, I would love to see it. And hopefully maybe in the next six to eight months, we'll see some more uh, vehicles come down the line. But the Cobra Fang, as of right now, has not been officially announced by Hasbro. Uh, I am super excited to see the Cobra Claw, though. That thing, I am loving the redesign they did and made it sure it came into the classified line. I'm super excited about that one. As excited I was for the Flight Pod. The Flight Pod and the Cobra Claw are my absolute 
favorite Cobra vehicles. Right now, I think I have, right now I have four, maybe five Royal American Hero flight pods. And I think I have three complete Cobra Claws. They're nice little vehicles, and I'm super excited to see them come to Classified. I'll be picking that one up for sure. Now, let's talk about something else San Diego Comic-Con related. The Once Upon a Man figure from Hasbro. Of course, this was the G.I. Joe Classified exclusive at the convention. You had to be at the convention. You got a ticket. You collected things. You were able to put in your pre-order. Boom, you're done, right? And like I said in a previous video, based on last year, that these figures would be exclusive to the convention, and then a few days later, they would show up on Hasbro Pulse for the sell whatever was left over. Now, somebody in uh, Twitter or a chat or somebody told me that what happens is that they sell them at the convention, and whatever is left over, they basically have to count the inventory. They have to send it back. So San Diego Comic-Con is in California. They have to send all the inventory back to, I guess, Rhode Island, Nantucket or some of that, wherever Hasbro HQ is. They count the inventory. And then what they do is they take that and they put that up on the website for pre-order. And I believe somebody along the line even said it would be up on August 5th. And then you get all these people on the forums like, when is the Once Upon a Man? coming available on Hazard Pulse, and it's like August 5th, guys. August 5th, 11 o'clock. Now, August 5th comes around. Hasbro, man, sometimes I feel if Hasbro didn't have bad luck, they wouldn't have any luck at all. And But sometimes they do it to themselves as well, okay? So uh, Once Upon a Man, Cobra Commander goes up. It's a limit of five per person, and it's only available to premium people at first. The thing is, it's kind of annoying as a collector. Now, I was never going to buy this guy from Hasbro Pulse, so I'm okay with it, but I know there's a lot of frustrated collectors out there, and it is frustrating when you're trying to collect a line, and you just can't make it happen. And you're like, why am I collecting this line if I can't even get the figures? But the thing is, Hasbro did this thing where they're like, oh, you're a limit of five per order. And I'm sorry... Nobody needs five. You might need two. So you're going to open one. You're not going to open one. You're going to do the other three. You're going to resell the other three for profit. And you can, some people, you know what? That's okay. Like you can resell and you're like making money and you're like, okay, well, that's money I can put back into my collection. That's okay. Okay. At a point. But you know, there's people out there that are just scalping this. They're buying all five. They're going to sell them for triple on eBay. And then it doesn't leave any for the real collectors that just want it or whatever, right? That is frustrating. And the thing is, when it comes to Hasbro, their business, so random numbers here, just say they had 2,000 once upon a man, uh, sorry, once a man figures in stock on HasbroPulse.com, ready to go at 11 o'clock. And the thing is, they don't care if they get 2,000 single orders or they get 400 orders of five. That's 2,000 figures. They got your money, so they don't care if they do 2,000 single sales or 400 bulk orders. They got your money, so like, they, they're good. They're like, yay, okay, we serve 2,000 or 400 customers. They don't care, and the thing is, I think five for an exclusive item is too much. It should have been like two, maybe three, but five, you should have been able to, they should have tried to reach more collectors with these figures. So, premium people got a shot at it first. They bought them up. When it went live to the public on uh, August 5th, they had, had hardly anything left. So they sold out in a couple of minutes and people were pissed. And then later on during the day, in the evening, it came out. Well, guess what, guys? We got more coming and we're going to put them up for pre-order on August 6th. They messed up. I don't know who it has, bro. Pulse messed up. They were supposed to go live at 11 and somebody pressed the button and it went live at 8 a.m. Eastern time. And basically anyone could just log onto the website and buy it. And of course, you know, you've got people who are like, oh, I got to check that at 11 and people at eight are buying it and they were able to buy them and basically left less for the people at 11 o'clock Eastern. So, I mean, that's just the way, I guess, the cookie crumbles. That's the way collecting goes, but it leaves a bad taste in people's mouths and it is frustrating to a point. And I feel that frustrating on forums, on Twitter. People are really upset that they won't be able to get this classic figure that, you know what, they've been looking forward to. And it is very, very frustrating as a collector to see this stuff 
constantly happen. Anyways, so let me know. Did you get your once a man figure? Did you get it on like the 5th? Did you get it on the 6th? Are you a premium member? So you're able to get in early and make sure you get it. Is it worth it for you to pay that extra price of the membership for a year to get these things early? Let me know in the comments how you feel. Anyways, so basically I think like I said, I previously covered G.I. Joe panel with Sergeant Slaughter and Cup and the Transformer crossover and all the figure releases in its separate video. But I just wanted to expand on some of this stuff for the podcast. So we'll leave that here. Next up, let's talk Transformers at San Diego Comic-Con. Just a quick update as I'm editing the file here uh, related to the Once a Man figure. Basically, GameStop Canada was able to secure a bunch and I was able to walk into a GameStop uh, put zero money down and I was able to pre-order uh, one. Hopefully it comes in soon. Anyways, we'll see how that goes. Okay, so now let's flip over to Transformers and San Diego Comic-Con and see what happened there. Now, we're kind of starting at the end, working our way backwards. Like the Like a Man exclusive from G.I. Joe, Marvel's Deadhead, and which is strangely related to Transformers and the Fractured Friendship 2-pack went up for pre-order again live on their website today and sold fairly well I think. I don't think that Fractured 2-pack is probably that much of a hot seller to be honest with you. I mean you can only go to the wells so many times and try to sell that Megatron to collectors out there but I'm sure there is a market for it. But anyways, I didn't get it. So originally I was going to do a separate video like I did for the G.I. Joe panel and talk about everything Transformers related. But like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, my computer actually died. So just timetables didn't work out. And now we're filming this or re I'm recording this. So that didn't happen. So we'll talk about a lot of Transformers stuff right here right now. Big things happen. No pun intended. So we finally got sort of that big reveal of the Studio Series 86 Constructor concept that we knew was coming. They're supposed to be sold in all the waves throughout 2025. They're going to be individually sold. And very interesting here because it's not like Menasaur or the come forthcoming uh, Superion, which kind of is going to have the same, they have the same kind of build where Menasaur was this body and you attach the things to it. The Constructicons are very much going to be like their Generation 1 counterpart where you have two legs, two arms, a torso, and sort of a chest and all these part forming parts to make them Devastator. And I'm super looking forward to it. I already have the Combiner Wars box set, but it's never been opened. Um, it's still in the box. I'm, I'm, very, I'm, I'm very interested to get these Constructicons. Now, of course... The interesting thing here is Scavenger and Bone Crusher, which are both the arms, are going to be sold as deluxes. Mixmaster and Scrapper, which are the legs, are going to be sold as Voyagers. And then you're going to have Hook and Long Haul with a bunch of other pieces uh, sold as a Commander class together. So that is going to be pretty sweet. So it's going to be close to the height, the similar height of Menasaur. And that is, that is so awesome. I'm super looking forward to this. It's in the 86 series. So you know it's going to have sweet colorings. I think it's going to be awesome. Uh, man, there's going to be so many Transformers this year coming. This is going to be a good series. Super excited for this. Um, let me know. Devastator is one of those key figures in the Transformer world. And like, are you guys going to make sure you collect all of them? The thing is, I feel like people learned the hard way with Minasaur. Like there was a breakdown was really hard to get. For some reason, I think it was during the Big V or like, you know, that time where like stuff wasn't getting out to stores. Anyways, breakdown was hard to get and people still have Minasaurs that don't have that leg component. And that sucks for them. So I hopefully people have learned. I understand people don't necessarily want to pre-order Transformers, but... Hopefully, man, I would recommend if you get a chance, pre-order the Transformers, go to GameStop, get your discount, get them out a deal, and just pre-order them. And then you're you're done. And you know what I mean? It's going to be released over the different waves. So it's not like you got to plunk down a bunch of money at the first releases to get all six of them. That's my hot tip right now. Pre-order these so you don't run into a similar situation that people ran into with Menasaur. Okay, moving on. The one thing of note that they did reveal was this crossover Knight Rider uh, kit car. I think that really hits the nostalgia really hard. I think that's re a really nice crossover. Some of the crossovers they've done have like been out there or whatever, but this is like basically looks like an Autobot car 
and it's Kit, and it turns into a nice humanoid. I, I think they really nailed it, and of course it's in that uh, the kind of like the retro packaging uh, from the 80s. So that one's cool. I mean, they also they did uh, they did that one. They did the Triple T crossover, which we had already discussed. And then they also talked about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle party wagon, uh, which I think previously had been revealed, but they discussed it here at the convention as something new because maybe somebody hadn't already seen it. Now, for reveals, they revealed a bunch of stuff for the coming waves. For me, I'm not going to go in depth on the movie figures because I don't really do the movie figures. Um, The Michael Bay figures, I I watch the movies, but I don't collect the toys. So if we're going to go look at... A couple things here. They did the Reactivate Bumblebee part of Studio Series. And this is very interesting. They were asked in an interview after Comic-Con, hey, what's what's up with um, Reactivate? And they basically said, we have no combat right now because that's not in our hands. I personally, as an avid gamer, I think Reactivate is going to be canceled. That is sucky for a lot of people, but like that Transformer game, it it was kind of sold as, oh, this is going to be a triple-A Transformer game. Transformer games have a niche market. I I just don't think there was going to be a big market for it, and I I think it's canceled. The idea, the, the fact that they don't have any information as the toy company responsible for getting the toys out for it is a big red flag that this thing is in trouble. And so what they've done here is previously, this Bumblebee came in a two pack with, I believe, Starscream, and it was really expensive. And what they've done here is since we don't know when the reactivate is coming out, we need to make some money on this mold because we've made this tooling and stuff. So, what they're going to do is going to separate it from the two pack and they're going to sell it individually in an upcoming wave. So, I mean, we'll see how it goes. Look, I'll be honest with you, I don't want to see the reactivate game canceled. I just have that funny feeling that along with like this. And like the trailer was removed from a website. There's a lot of red flags going off here that we'll never see this game. Anyways, hopefully we'll see how it goes. Next up, we have Deluxe 114 Megatron from the Transformer 1 movie. I think a lot of people are excited about this figure. And the reason why, it's a Megatron figure. It's a tank alt mode. And it's something different than the Siege mold. It looks really cool, really different, really unique. And I think they really nailed the toy. The toy looks good. I think a lot of people are going to be super excited to get their hands on that Transformer 1 Megatron. Anyways, let me know, guys. Are you supporting this movie? Like, we all know it's kind of like aimed a little more at kids than the hardcore collectors. But I mean, as a Transformer fan, I'm probably still going to go see in theater uh, to support it. And the toys, they're pretty cool. They're, They're the deluxes, not the kitty ones with the two step transformations, but the regular studio series ones have been really spot on so far of course then one of the other things they revealed was the transformers revenge of the fallen studio series 15th anniversary autobot multi-pack wow that's a mouthful and it comes with a bunch of transformers a five i think four or five and you know what i said earlier i don't care about movie figures and i really don't care about this hard fact revenge of the fallen was not a good movie and the fact that it's 15 years old already and that we're celebrating its anniversary i just think this is meant to cash in on some uh molds they had kicking around at the studio because i don't know i guess there's probably fans of this studio series uh, like revenge of the fallen figures out there but i'm not one of them so let's move on of course they also reveal the Another multi-pack that we all knew was coming, we've done videos on him, the Dino King repaint is a Hasbro PulseCon exclusive set for release on September 13th. If you're a fan of, I think, uh, right, Victory, this is something that you've been looking forward to, and uh, I think they did a good job on the repaint. We all knew that was coming, and it's exciting to see it in that box set version, so you don't have to try to hunt down all the individual figures. I mean, I still haven't really seen a swoop around. I think I've seen all the other ones, but just not a swoop of the original releases of the Dinobot versions. So it's nice that it's coming in the box set. And I think a lot of people are going to be uh, excited to pick this one up. Then we move down the pipeline figures. And the pipeline figures are interesting this time. And this is sort of why I never got around to doing a Transformer video as well. I mean, before my computer broke, I was always like, eh. Do I want to do an in-depth video? Because the pipeline figures, there's a common thread here. And the common thread is basically, they're all previously store exclusives. 
that are now being ripped away from their store exclusivity and just being sold on part of the main line. So the first one is Generation 1 Cosmos. Now, this one, I have a Cosmos. I got them at TFCon uh, the last year. This one was super hard to get. Most people didn't see them on, on any shelves. He was part of the Velocitron series from Walmart. And the thing is, he showed up at Ross later on, like a few months ago, and he was super discounted. So... This one's kind of a kick in the jimmies because, like, they're re-releasing them so more people can get them. But a lot of people already have him. And the people that really wanted him made sure they got him already. So, I don't know. I mean, obviously, I think it's going to be a hot seller because there's a lot of fans out there that don't have them. But interesting. Next one is Generation 2 Breakdown. I just completed uh, a segment earlier here on this, this part, this podcast, saying that a lot of people couldn't find Generation 1 uh, uh, breakdown. This is the Generation 2 re-release. I mean, this could, if you can find Generation 2 breakdown, this could do it for you for your Menasaur because you don't really see a lot of the bot in the real Menasaur form. So, I mean, this could do it for people. Uh, next up is Generation 1 Origin Bumblebee, another basically Target exclusive from Buzzworthy line. And it was a Target exclusive. Now it's being mass released. So that's kind of, it's kind of cool, obviously, but it's interesting that these exclusives are being released for the masses. Armada Wheeljack was another one. I mean, the Armada line, all these Transformer fans out there, everyone starts at different times. You know, I'm a Generation 1 person. There's Armada people. There's Energon people. There's Robots in Disguise people. And Armada is 20 years old now. So, I mean, people are looking for these reissues. I think that's going to be a hot seller. Next one up is War for Cybertron. Uh, Ramjet, I do think that's going to be a hot seller as well. That cone head mold that was originally sold as an Amazon exclusive has been a hot, hot, hot property. They already released Dirge. Uh, now this is Ramjet, and I think I think we've already been told that Thrust is coming again at some point. I could be wrong about that, but I mean it's nice to see these cone heads re-released. Next up is Tarn. Very seen Tarn. Uh, this is just a recolor. It's IDW Tarn. So this will be a different bit of a paint scheme, but still cool figure. Next up is Victory Galaxy Shuttle. Another case of, this was a Velocitron exclusive to Walmart. Interesting thing here. The Velo the, the Galaxy Shuttle seen like hardly any releases in main USA stores. So a lot of people, a lot of American collectors never seen Victory Galaxy Shuttle at all. But on the flip side, he was clogging the shelves here in Canada because he was so expensive. I believe his retail price was $86, uh, Canadian that is. So when you, you know, you purchase him, I think it came to like $95. I mean, he's a cool figure, but I mean, I don't know if he's $95 worth. I think it depends if you're into that Victory stuff, right? Um, so... Anyways, long story short, a lot of Americans were getting these Victory Saber, sorry, a lot of Americans were getting these Victory Galaxy shuttle figures off Canadians because, I mean, we could go get them. I could walk into any store when these were out and there'd be two or three on the shelves. So it's very interesting that this is being re-released. At least Hasbro was uh, listening. They realized that people are like, I couldn't get this. Can you re-release this? You know, just like uh, Generation 1 Grimlock is coming back. So it's nice to see the Galaxy Shuttle come back and a lot of people out there who maybe missed him the first time will be able to pick him up again. And then the last one was Generation 1 Overcharge, uh, just another, uh, I believe, repaint. So that was the pipeline figures. Very interesting to see all these previously exclusive figures now being released to the mainline public. So that'd be interesting to see how that goes. It's always never good when you're like locking these figures, especially highly sought after figures to exclusive contracts. So it's cool to see that them get their second chance at this, a second life. Now, one of the biggest things at the show was they officially showed off in detail what Studio Series 86 Prime was like, how he transformed. They did a video on him. I have to be honest, when I originally seen the video, sorry, the pictures release of Prime, I was like, yeah, he's cool. He's kind of cool. I'd probably get him. When they showed him in motion being transformed, shown his accessories i was like i need this guy i made sure i actually almost missed the pre-order for gamestop uh i wasn't really aware when it was going to happen and i just happened to see a post and somebody said it was up 
and I made sure I went in and pre-ordered uh, him. He's an expensive boy, but I mean, as a fan of Studio Series 86, as a fan of Transformers, this is a must-get, and I'm super, super excited. I'm, I think I'm most excited for this figure right now. Then, on the flip side of that, we finally, finally got showroom floor shots of the 40th anniversary Rishu Optimus Prime that's come to Walmart. I did a video on this like months ago saying that this was rumored to come. JD Prime 17 said it was coming. And I was like, when is this coming? We're like, we're running out of year. Anyways, long story short, we've seen pictures of it now. It does exist. So now we just need that bombshell and ram horn two back as well. But Prime's coming. And as much as I already have a Prime reissue, I got to get that one as well. Of course, he's done in the movie colors. So he's got some really nice coloring. And this is a must get for any Generation 1 fan. And I'm super excited for that. Anyways, so that's pretty cool. Then let's see what else we got here. Now, my notes say, I already previously talked about the Transformer 1 movie. This thing, I think this thing is gaining some steam. Of course, they released the second trailer during the show and it got some major views. I think it has potential. Obviously, it is a highly focused kids movie. It is to get a new generation of collectors out there, kids, to be interested in Transformers. Um, I do think it's probably going to be really funny. I do think it's going to be entertaining. Um, of course, they had a big panel at the uh, convention where they had all the actors there. Chris Hemsworth was there and he was talking Transformers. Uh, he's also going to be in the next Transformers movie. That's something we're going to talk about in another video. Anyways, so I do think this has potential. I think it's going to have a pretty good opening weekend. I don't know about that second weekend, but I think it's going to have a good opening weekend. I know I'll be there to watch and support the, the, the movie. Um, hopefully you guys check it out. Let me know in the comments. What do you think? Are you going to actually go see the Transformer 1 movie? Or are you going to wait for streaming uh, like, like six months later? Um, or... And do you like the toys? Like, will you see the movie and get the toys or will you just get the toys and not worry about the movie? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I'm just curious what the mindset to the community is on this show. Anyways, so that was pretty much the Transformers San Diego Comic-Con stuff. Um, we got a new series coming, Prime Generations coming. Actually, Transformers Generations Prime is coming. Uh, we got the, uh, what do we got? We got the aerial bots coming too. There is a lot of good Transformers coming down the line. My wallet is hurting between G.I. Joe and Transformers. So San Diego Comic-Con was very positive. I actually put a poll up on my YouTube uh, community channel. And I polled uh, which, which, who felt, wait, sorry, I polled. Who do you think had the better San Diego Comic-Con announcement slash reveals? Was it G.I. Joe or was it Transformers? And it's very interesting to see this because my channel is Transformers and G.I. Joe. So I think sometimes I worry about growth because they're two different people. But I mean, I'm a unique guy. I like both. So I put it up and with it was a super close to poll. According to my calculations, I had... X amount of people vote, and it was 52% uh, Transformers to 48% G.I. Joe. So it was like super close. It was basically tied for all intents and purposes. And so let me know, what do you think? Who had the better show? Did Transformers show better stuff or did G.I. Joe show better stuff? Let me know. I personally think the Prime, 86 Prime was nice. Oh, man. It's, it's tough, and the 86th and the 40th anniversary issue prime. Originally, I was thinking that G.I. Joe with that classified Rattler really did a good job. But me, personally, I don't think I'm going to support it at this moment. Not because I don't think it's a good product. It's just because it's extremely expensive and I can't really afford it. But, so if I had to go Cobra Rattler versus some of the things on the Transformers that I'm going to get, like I'm definitely going to get to get the Constructicons, I'm getting 86 Prime, I'm getting reissue Prime, um... I'm going to go with, like, I'm going to put my vote on the Transformers panel, uh, that they had the better, like, content. What do you think? 
So that's basically the podcast for this month. Uh, if you can, think about hitting the like button, possibly hit the subscribe button. Check out some more of our other videos here. And if you like what we're doing, make sure you come back. Catch you in the next one. Bye.